Today I would just like to talk about the exhibits that the state of Kansas entered during Dana Chandler's 2012 trial. Most of the exhibits consisted of photographs, which were each given an individual exhibit number. And that's how the exhibits numbered over 1,000. There were 200 crime scene photographs, 75 photos of Mike and Karen's vehicles, about 60 photos of Dana's vehicle, 60 of Dana's sister's home, there were 70 autopsy photos, and there were 170 photographs of Dana Chandler's pull-behind trailer that she was staying in temporarily at the time of her arrest. There were also different items such as a business card, some tennis shoes, a towel, a green blanket, a white shirt, a black purse, a wallet, a necklace, a checkbook, invoices, a black computer case, and computer hard drive. As I've said before, Jackie Spradling created an illusion of evidence by packaging up many of these items and piling them high in the courtroom to create the illusion that the state had an abundance of evidence against Dana Chandler, when in fact, not a single exhibit proved that Dana Chandler was in Kansas, that Dana Chandler purchased a nine millimeter carbine rifle, which is an Uzi style weapon used to murder Mike and Karen, that she ever purchased or possessed any specialty ammo, such as the ammo used to murder Mike and Karen, blue tipped ammo with the initials nine millimeter carb on the head stamp. None of them showed that any of Dana's DNA or fingerprints or hair were found at the scene of the crime or that anything connecting her to the murders or to the victims was found in her home, even though they obtained a search warrant within about a week to 10 days after the murders. This is a case that went cold due to lack of evidence for nine years, but within a week, they were able to get a search warrant to go through her home in Denver from top to bottom while she was in Kansas attending the funeral of her ex-husband. And they didn't find a single item that connected her to the murders, not a single one. That's why the case went cold for nine years. But when they got a new district attorney, Chad Taylor, he went right, right to work and to set out and make this arrest, even without evidence. Now, he, he made a statement that, that there was some new evidence that was going to be tested, you know, giving the impression that something had caused this case to go from a cold case to an arrest. And when they arrested Dana down in Duncan, uh, one of the reporters down there asked him, what was the evidence that broke this case wide open? And, and Chad Taylor declined to comment. Now, they, they mentioned some gum that was found in a yard a few doors down, and, and when that was tested, that wasn't Dana either. And none of the fingerprints were connected to Dana, and, and none of the hairs were connected to Dana, including the hair found on the shell casing, which was identified as a Caucasian limb hair. I mean, that's connect, that's attached to the one of the casings ejected from the weapon used to murder them. That's pretty close. I mean, some people argue that maybe it was picked up from the carpet, but it was uh, identified by uh, Dr. John Stewart, you know, as the limb hair. And in his uh, profile report, he excluded Mike, Karen, and Dana as the contributors of the mitochondrial DNA profile that uh, was found in that hair. The hair itself was consumed in testing, but they did obtain a mitochondrial DNA profile so uh, Dr. John Stewart was the manager of the mitochondrial DNA program at the FBI in Quantico. So uh, that was a significant exhibit. Uh, I wanted to mention another exhibit. Number 334 was a handwritten report from Eugene Robinson. Now Eugene was a neighbor of Karen Hartness's and uh, he described a 90s model, black Mitsubishi like the one Dana Chandler drove with Colorado plates parked near Karen's home in April. There was also another witness named Margaret Linden who worked at the Joaquini travel stop 
which is a town between Denver and Topeka, Kansas. The state uh, questioned, Jackie questioned many witnesses about an alleged book that Dana purchased and, and um, tried to give the impression that they had evidence that Dana Chandler was in fact seen in Waukini. It, it was the craziest thing because on one hand they, they claimed she bought gas cans so she could sneak into Kansas and then at the same time they made put on witnesses that stated that they had seen her in Waukini, Kansas. So which is it? Make up your mind, you know. Would, did she buy gas cans so she didn't have to stop for gas or did she stop for gas in broad daylight and, and in front of witnesses with potential surveillance cameras? There weren't any, but you know, I mean, make up your mind. Uh, but anyway, they just threw some theories out there and hope one of them would stick. But uh, anyway, Margaret Linden had been interviewed by Topeka Police Officer Michael Barron. Um, Michael Barron was uh, very honest in his testimony. He was repeatedly uh, questioned about Margaret Linden's statement to him, and he never wavered from what she originally said. And what she originally uh, told him was that she saw a car uh, a black Mitsubishi at pump eight, and she, she said it had an out-of-state uh, tag, and she thought it was Virginia. And and she that never changed, and Michael Barron never, you know, changed from uh, saying that's what he was told by her. But interestingly enough, when she got to the preliminary hearing, Margaret Linden changed her statement and said that the car she saw had Colorado plates, so she was you know, mistaken or um, something. I'm not sure why it changed, but it changed. So we had two witnesses saying they saw a car like Dana Chandler's with Colorado plates, but there was only one problem. Dana Chandler wasn't driving a Mitsubishi with Colorado plates. She was driving a car with Arizona plates. However, in closing arguments, uh, Jackie Spradling invited the jury to speculate that perhaps Miss Chandler had switched plates to go to Topeka and do some killing, in her words. But uh, there's a problem with that, too, because Dana Chandler didn't register her car in Colorado until September of 2002, which is three months after the murders. So no matter how Jackie Spragling tried to spin that little web, it uh, sort of backfired on her because, first of all, she put on witnesses that were adamant about seeing a car like Dana's in the neighborhood at a gas station between Denver and, and Topeka with Colorado plates, only to find out that Dana drove a car with Arizona plates. But how unethical is it for Jackie Spragling to suggest that Dana Chandler may have just pulled an old switcheroo and just, you know, I mean, after all, she's, you know, in Jackie's mind, she's, the person responsible for murdering two people. Is it too hard to believe, she asked the jury, that she might have switched plates to do some killing? Well, maybe that would be a plausible suggestion, but not if Dana Chandler didn't have license places, plates to switch. Not if she didn't register her car in Colorado. I mean, it, 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 none of it, it makes any sense at all. And if she switched plates, she would, uh, it, it, I, I can't even, it's baffling to me. I can't even speak. So anyway, I am done talking about the evidence or lack thereof. And uh, I just, I'm left with a big question mark about why this case is being retried. Why after the Supreme Court made it abundantly clear that Dana Chandler was convicted on information that was false or misleading. They described the PFA in their decision as imaginary, make-believe, fictional, non-existent. They said that you know, the prosecutors have the duty to protect the system, to protect the defendant when they fail. The system fails. It's stretched to the breaking point. And they said that's what happened in this case. And they said that they reserve the 
misconduct label for those cases that have a certain level of culpability beyond mere negligence. That's what we have here. So why is Mike K. Gay re retrying Dana Chandler when he knows that there's no evidence connecting her to the murders? He has a dual responsibility as a prosecutor. ABA Rule 3.8. And, and, and I, I maintain that he is failing in that responsibility to protect people from being wrongfully convicted. He can't do anything about what Jackie Spradling did or Chad Taylor did, but he is responsible for what he's doing. You know, this wasn't his circus. These aren't his monkeys. But everything that's happened from the reversal forward, that is his responsibility. They... He can't blame them for that. They can't blame him for what they did, but he can't blame them for what he's doing. And I have no doubt that people far higher in authority are influencing DA Kage's decision in this matter because there's a lot to lose here. Nobody wants to admit they made a mistake. Nobody wants to admit they wrongfully convicted Danny Chandler. But as I said in my last video, the very arrest warrant issue was based on a faulty probable cause affidavit. That's not supposed to happen according to the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Nobody's supposed to be searched, or have their property seized or their person seized without probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. Richard Volley's probable cause affidavit wasn't worth the paper it was written on because he didn't sign it. And Judge Anderson missed it and signed a warrant for her arrest based on that. But nobody took responsibility for that. Oh, it was signed all right. <laughs> it was even notarized, made it look all official, but it was signed by somebody other than the affiant. I don't know what it's gonna take for Dana Chandler to get justice, but I believe in miracles. And that's who's where my faith is, because my faith in the system is shot. My faith in the leaders in Kansas, the Attorney General, the former Topeka Chief of Police, the current Sheriff, Mike Kage, the DA, even the U.S. Attorney, whom we've notified about the perjury and subordination of perjury that took place in this case. And we've asked for investigations from the Attorney General, Bill Cochran, Chief of Police, DAKG, has received copies of all these requests for investigations, and the U.S. Attorney, Stephen McAllister. We haven't even received a written response. We received one from the city of Topeka, from Lisa Robertson, the city attorney, informing my husband that even if what we said was true, that did Richard Boley had lied under oath about Dana Chandler during her trial, that he had committed perjury, that Jackie Spradling had suborned perjury, that the statute of limitations for perjury has already expired. So she stated that it would be futile to expend precious resources, limited resources on an investigation when there could be no criminal charges filed. So apparently, the city of Topeka doesn't care if one of their own lies about a criminal defendant under oath in a trial, which led to a conviction. The lead detective, no less, who carried a lot of clout, a lot of weight, I can only assume with the jurors, being the lead detective in a case that lingered for nine years. I want to know who cares. Is there anybody who cares? that this happened to Dana Chandler? That she was convicted by people who lied? I care.